from KSMQ in southern Minnesota, this is Off 90. This week we visit Mankato, Winona, Austin. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. The community of Mankato is very fortunate to have this space. As a visitor just coming into the space, the initial impact is, is very impressive. It actually has a warm quality because it's so symmetrically designed that you have these spaces that, and the acoustics are just so alive. The architecture in the building itself is almost like a giant work of art. And so this was really a cultural place that was central to the city. And we like to try to maintain that sense of history here in terms of making it a cultural home for not only the artists that have studios and um, practically live here, but people who come in and are appreciating the architecture and the visual arts. It actually has a timeless quality to it. it as long as that piece exists, it can, the viewer can have an opportunity to, to partake of that over a very long period of time. It's important as it's got a history of protecting and providing space for various arts organizations. Artists that have studios in the basement can continue their work in a, in a protective environment, 24-hour um, access at a reasonable price. People can walk in the door and share with the artist their vision of a world that they've created. Andrew Carnegie was very successful not only as a businessman but also in accomplishing his vision of providing information and education to um, children throughout the whole entire country and in Europe. Carnegie funded 65 libraries in Minnesota and about 40 of them survive and they serve a lot of different functions. Now throughout the country a lot of them have survived as art galleries so his gifts of libraries in 800 plus communities to the United States added to the public education system in a huge way because it allowed access to information at any age level. So you could learn, if you were 80 years old, you could come in and learn anything you wanted to do about forestry or mining or art. I think he had a vision. He had a vision that was, was so simple in some respects that I'm going to offer you know, communities across the United States, an opportunity to provide a public library, a place where members of that community can walk in the door and for free have a book. And when you come into any of the Carnegie libraries that were built around the turn of the century, the sense of craftsmanship that they put into all of the woodwork around here and the care and the meticulous detail that they put into everything is you know, the same thing that we do when we're creating individual works of art. And I think the idea of his gift and, the, and now that the fact that the, this building is a gift to the community of Mankato, it's a gift to the region, it's a gift to the artist of the community, that a group of, of volunteers, a group of individuals who just doggedly and stubbornly say, we will keep the doors open, we will open it up, turn the lights on, pay the heat bill, sit here, and allow anyone to come and enjoy the space and admire the, 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 the beauty of this building as architecture, but also to have an ever-changing view of different art, visual artist interpretation of the world. Mankato originally wanted a grant of like $70,000, and Mr. Carnegie wrote back and said, Oh, I think 40000 is fine for you. <laughs> and once these buildings were gifted to that community, they stepped away. The initial $40,000 that was given to the city of Mankato to build this building, the city will provide the piece of property, and then the city will 
will maintain this building from that point on. When you look at the old original photographs, each room was highly decorated. Because when you look around at the woodwork, it's like this has got like the best quality of everything that they had at the time. Um, so this was like one of the most innovative plant floor plans at the time. It's one of the first libraries in Minnesota that had a suspended ceiling. Well, architecturally it's unique because it it's, has a skylight, and I think the skylight too was never open to the sky because that was a budget cut. It has a curved rotunda, and you don't see many curved walls in major architecture. But the curved wall is, it makes it interesting now I mean, there, to hang work on those walls because most artists are, are used to these flat walls, and the people come in with these large, large paintings, and they'll go, well, how do you make it hang on that curved wall? Most of the windows are still the original glass. It's that wonderful old glass. If you've ever you know, grown up in an old home or been to old homes, and you suddenly realize that that glass is a moving, living thing. And in here, it's, most of them are still intact in its 1901 quality. As the light changes during the day, it has an evolution quality to it. It's not a static space. Some contemporary galleries are, there are no windows. When an exhibition's here, it will shift and change according to the natural light and according to the environment. And I think that's one thing that's unique about this space compared to other galleries. When the library moved to the new facility in 76, the city of Mankato had some of their city offices here for a period of time. And there was a group of individuals that configured a little exhibition space in the basement. And that was the beginning of the Mankato Area Arts Council. In 80, 81, when the city decided to sell it, they no longer wanted to use it for office space. They came up for sale and the individuals in the basement petitioned to buy the building for an arts center. And I think in, it took about two years of negotiations until finally the city of Mankato sold the building to the Mankato Arts Center for a dollar. From that point on, the Mankato Arts Council, which is the Carnegie Arts Center, has maintained this building. In that initial phase, to generate revenue and to continue the idea of it being an all-inclusive arts center, there was the Suzuki School of Music was in the basement, uh, children's music education program, uh, Cherry Creek Theater, which was based in St. Peter, moved here uh, and had a theater space, black box theater space for I'd say seven or eight years. They, as an organization, did a lot of restoration work in the building, painted and cleaned and redid. So they contributed an amazing amount. Then it took hold of, of the fact that there wasn't really a, a visual arts center outside of the university situation. So that's the evolution of what the program is now, focusing on the visual arts. Each arts, visual arts, literary arts, they all have different needs and different spatial requirements. And so this sort of seemed to be a better fit, uh, the way it's evolved now. The purpose is to provide a protective space for visual artists in this region, in this community. There are private studios that, that, that the artists that are lucky enough to be able to rent a space. We have waiting lists for that, but there people change and they leave the space. That's a highly valuable um, aspect of, of this facility because a lot of people, young artists are renting space. It's a community of artists and they also are Besides just having a space to work in, they're committed to keeping the building open and to the public. There are 13 artists in residence in the basement. And these artists pay a monthly studio fee. They, they have 24-hour access. And part of their lease requires that they also volunteer three hours a month to keep the gallery open. I mean, we have no problem maintaining a gallery schedule. There are artists that do amazing work. The artist in the basement pretty much covers most of the monthly expenses. The electric, the heat. We ask our exhibiting artists to pay a gallery fee because usually we provide um, a staff to work with the artists to install the exhibit. We will print the labels, we will mail out the postcards, 
And so that, the artist speed covers just their exhibit. And it also is the idea too that when an individual puts down some money, they're gonna fall through. Because early in the history of the gallery, there wasn't that kind of contract and there wasn't that commitment. So we, you know, we had to step up our professionalism in order to educate the artists because most, a lot of these artists are emerging artists. This would be maybe their first formal exhibition. So we act as actually um, our expertise. We educate that artist so that this show, they'll learn from this show, which means they'll continue to, in their next exhibition, they'll be much more professional about how they approach their next exhibition, wherever it is. The idea of, of the arts is it takes patience. You have, you, you, you know, it's a lifelong commitment, even as, as a practicing artist, but as a viewer. I think it's harder and harder, I think, for the arts to survive in, in a culture where everyone expects something to happen in, in under 30 seconds. And I think that's where a long-term goal is to try to continue to educate the community about the, the, the patience it takes to appreciate the arts. Well, art has to exist outside of a, a static exhibition space. So this one actually allows it to happen that way. My name is Mary Solberg and I'm a visual artist. I've always had an aptitude for art. I think in high school I realized I had an aptitude for it. I won a few awards then. You can kind of go into the area that you etched. I guess when I was a kid um, I wasn't always using oil paints. I was maybe doing a lot more drawing then. Eventually I went to school for other things. It's just always what I really wanted to do. Life gets in the way and you have to work and I've had uh, careers where, you know, it just, I didn't have a lot of time, but it was always there in the background. And eventually went back to school to um, Viterbo University in La Crosse after <laughs> being a, a lot of other places and doing a lot of other things to get my fine art degree because it's just always what I really wanted to do. It's actually really easy to clean up after this. It looks like it's kind of a mess. So I did that and um, started getting more into doing my art, even though I was also running a business at the same time. All your brushes are actually preserved. They're, they're in great shape. You don't have to clean them or anything. I don't know that I'd want to change my life experience. You know, I think that I've learned and grown a lot from everything I did. I mean, ideally, if I would have had the luxury to just not think about a career. It's a pretty fun thing to do. It was always my hope that, you know, I would generate enough income some way to allow myself to just devote to my creative life. And actually in the last couple, you know, three years, I've been able to more and more do it full time. So sometimes you can wreck it and it's hard to recover, but it's almost a compulsion, I would have to say. It's kind of like being in the zone. I try to get in the studio every day that I can, that I'm able to. And I'm fortunate that I have my studio at home. So um, I usually get in there by about 9, 9, 10 o'clock, and then work all day long till about 6. This is actually um, matte. It's wax mixed with resin. I'm hyper aware, you know, I, I'm very aware. I'm, I'm really living in the moment. So uh, it's, you know, as it's not an avoidance thing, it's really an immersion thing. You know, it feels really great, time goes by, passes, um, and it's, it's just a really, the process itself is, is just really gratifying. And I just, you know, I, I actually mix paints right on this palette. I really don't even recognize time going by, you know? I, I'm just, I mean, it's evolving as I'm before the canvas or the board or whatever, and, you know, I'm kind of free associating in the background. It's just a very, um, and, and, and literally, hours can go by. And then I just kind of start adding color, and I sometimes forget to eat, which is unusual for me, so. It's just, it, it's a, it's a great place to be. 
It's almost like layers and layers. It just kind of builds up and I'm definitely a portrait artist. I, I think that the eyes tell a lot. I think, the, you know, it's a, it's a very obvious way to express an emotion because, you know, a face does give you a lot of information. I would say my portraits were more about a psychological impact. The hardest thing is starting a new one usually. And sometimes it's just all there and I know what I want to do. It flows pretty good. And then other times, um, you know, it's just kind of a struggle. I call them everyday icons, various people from my life or historic people. I think there's sacred in all of us, and so it's my way of sort of venerating, you know, just the everyday person. This is actually um, kind of a portrait of a, a dear friend of mine who passed away, but she was a very uh, beautiful, very mystical lady. I call it the fortune teller. She was very exotic, and, uh, and this, she would look at you that way, like she could see right through you. So, yeah, she was something. It definitely feels like playing. There's, at this point, it's, you know, the image is, is pretty much there, so now I'm just sort of making it, you know, a little more interesting and trying different things. A lot of my images are um, obviously based on sort of religious iconography, and, but they're about, some of them are tongue-in-cheek, obviously. It's a self-portrait of myself as Eve. It's, um, it's called Another Bad Decision, and it's kind of the Eve um, taking a bite out of the forbidden fruit, um, which seemed like a rather innocuous thing to do, possibly, at the time. Well, it turned out to be you know, a very bad choice, and huge repercussions came out of that. And so it's just kind of tongue-in-cheek about sometimes, um, you know, you make decisions and ha they have unexpected results. The third one is called Surrender, and it's just, it, in this one, it's basically the concept of the strength and courage it takes to just completely be vulnerable and open yourself up, open yourself up to love, open yourself up to, you know, just your vulnerabilities. Um, I had started out thinking of doing sort of a circus theme, a, a, and this this one started out as a surrender. Started out as a juggler, and then, you know, things changed, and that happens a lot with my art. I, I might start in a direction and then think, now nah, this isn't working, and do something else. This is more of my sort of Catholic background coming through. Uh, people of my generation that went through Catholic school, if they were a girl or a woman, might have considered the nunhood as a good option, uh, at least for a little while. And so uh, my idea behind this, she's not going to go that route. You know, that's not her, that's not going to be her path. Well, she's thinking about it. The, the uniform doesn't fit well. She's got this, you know, she's more secular. She's probably not going to make it through the nunnery. And although it may not seem like it to, to myself, I'm a little more abstract. Um, I'm a little more playful with colors. Um, it's, it's definitely, um, I would say, it's about emotion. And these are all done with the oil pastel. And these are done on very aged boards. So that it gives it that sort of distinct kind of um, distressed look. It really is like being in kind of a meditative state as I'm working. This actually started the whole series of these icons that I do, these large icons. Um, and this, these are actually my, um, my great, great, great grandparents, Jefferson and Rebecca Toulouse. And I worked from just a tiny little photograph that was, you know, really hard to see a lot of detail. So as I decided to, to, you know, sort of venerate them, make them, you know, larger than life. And it was also kind of an emotional process because, you know, they were kind of like emerging into, you know, like they were coming to life. She was my mother's live-in caretaker and she was wonderful. So the name of this is the caregiver. So, and obviously she's a beautiful girl and she was fun to photograph and, and paint. That's my dog and, uh, you know, he's, he's, I wanted to venerate him, to use that word again. I just, uh, you know, he's pretty sweet. He's, he can be uh, fairly evil also at times, but <laughs> or he's, a, he's a pretty good dog. It really does look like him. <laughs> he's about eight years old. 
He's an Australian Shepherd. He's still alive. Yeah. Actually, he's got just a little little slice of blue in the other eye. Sometimes when I see that out of the corner of my eye, I think it's him. You know, um, a lot of them are about strength, about facing hardship and coming to the other side of it. Um, you know, just or moment a moment of realization, say in someone's life where their life was changed forever. I, I use this format to just just make them bigger, you know, make them more. I want to make them larger than life. I, I tend to be kind of isolated, and but I mean, truly, I do want people to see it. I want it, them to interact with it. You know, it feels good to be validated or questioned or, you know, critiqued. And that helps me to, you know, think about it and, and maybe improve. It's a language. It's some, something I guess I'm trying to say. So if you don't have an audience, then you're kind of, you know, alone. <laughs> It's good to get it out there. Well, I hope that in some cases that they're moved or, or it, it reminds them or brings some emotion out of them. I kind of like them to um, just take away from it what they want. And other times it's just more, um, I just want to paint a pretty picture. There's so many things that influence me, old photographs and family photographs and just interesting, strange images. I'm really into painting my ancestors and, and family, and um, so I collect a lot of pictures. Um, I also just find pictures sometimes at uh, um, antique places or junk, junk places. But they, they're a lot of the inspiration of my art. Sometimes dreams. Sometimes in the morning I know exactly what I'm going to do, and, and other times it's a little more uh, work. I'll just sit and look through my images and something, see if something comes. You know, it, it's weeks, days, it depends. Sometimes it really flows and, you know, I can, you know, under a week I can get a painting done or I might even do something in a couple days. Well, I'm very influenced by the masters, um, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Caravaggio, um, Lucas, Cranich the Elder. People do, I don't know how to draw. Well, you know, drawing isn't, that is one form of art, that is a form that, that I enjoy. But, I mean, art takes so many different forms and, you know, I, a person that even appreciates art can probably do art. I, it's just a matter of finding out your own, your own language. I'm a donut guy, and I think overall our donuts are probably the biggest in the Midwest. Well, you got to stand behind them when you lift one up. I mean, otherwise you could pull you over. Yeah, I'm a owner here at Super Fresh Produce. Uh, been here since 1980. Well, there's always been a produce market here, and the donuts uh, we started in right around 2003. You know, it was a homemade donut with homemade frosting. This is my donut cutter. These are the regular donut. So I pull that out. My scrap does get used again. I'll use it to make cinnamon rolls. I'm going to do a couple long johns here right now. There we go. And then we just kind of stretch them out and pat them down. And this is where our big ones come in. So what I'll do is I'll stretch this out a little bit more because they are so big and it would take forever to, to um, fry all the way through on them. So we stretch it out a little bit more, make sure all the air bubbles are out of there. There's my big donut cutter. And it's got to have a hole in the center. These are the biggest. Different uh, 
frostings to put on them, uh, the white, the chocolate, the uh, maple, and we also do a sugared and a glazed. Lots of times people call ahead and we'll order them a special way. And uh, we'll, we've written a happy birthday on them too, uh, different things like that. The, the big donuts are 209 each. We uh, try to keep them affordable. Just the overall taste of them, it's like, it's like they took their time and did it right. Who buys our donuts? It's, uh, it's just a, a great, a great cross section of the community. And uh, people from out of state come in, uh, certainly local people, rural people. We, you know, it's young people, it's older people. There is really no person that, that you can categorize as a donut eater. Every donut here is big, but it's, it's, it's like three donuts in one. So it fills me up pretty good. We always tell people, you know, they can share. You know, if they, if they don't want to have a whole one, they can share. But there's a lot of resistance to that. You know, they, they say they'll share, but in reality, I don't think people share very good with our donuts. They're, they're so good. They're homemade frosting, fresh made, you know, and they just don't share very well. I came here to buy as many donuts as my stomachs can carry. They're not good at sharing the donuts. I like to come here like once a month. I don't, I don't want to get tired of the donuts. Oh, you want to have that special treat. Well, I just got done moving a piano, so I figured <laughs> I deserve a donut this morning. So, I usually get their coffee. They have great coffee here, too. I've toured the whole United States. This is the best donuts. Uh, sorry, Winchells. That's it for now, but join us again next week for Off 90. Meanwhile, let us know what you think and tell us about any interesting people, places, or stories that you want to see here in the coming weeks. Then watch for the KSMQ crew out there, around your town, in our communities, along the back roads. Wherever arts, culture, and history can be found in southern Minnesota, that's where we'll be. But you can be sure we'll always be off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.